Thank you for um, voting Psalms 1. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. And this is going to, you know, just it's going to be by nature a little different than our classes in here, which were, you know, much more give and take because there's no way really to pick you up on the mic. Um, if that's not a big part of it, it's not a problem. But just this may be a little more presentational like me to you, which is, you know, that'll get old. But anyway, that's kind of how it'll go. So um, as far as I'm concerned, we can do this study for all of 2021. I mean, it's where do you stop in the Psalms, right? Even at three a week, that's still a year. And I doubt we're going to do three a week, especially where 119 is involved. So um, although we will look at three today, so that'll be fun. But why don't we open with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us and for keeping us safe and healthy. And uh, I pray that these studies will be, um, will be effective and enlightening and that your word will shine forth as truth in our lives and our hearts um, and that we will get a greater glimpse of you and your glory through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Shout out some favorite psalms. Oh, by the way, before we start, I did a teaching on the psalms um, I think two years ago on a Sunday for like three weeks. So if you were there and you can remember it, which I can't, uh, you may hear some things repeated, but um, that was kind of a stepping off point for this. I've learned a lot since then, but uh, those notes kind of came in handy in getting us rolling. So somebody tell me a favorite psalm. Sorry? 46. Why? Comfort. That's good. Somebody else? 100, because? Yeah, good. Psalm 100, thanksgiving and joyful celebration. All right, who else? 23. Probably don't have to ask you why, but... Yeah, comforted, taken care of. Yeah. Who else? Well, you probably know what my favorite one is because I've mentioned it probably once a year. It's Psalm 1. <clears throat> Although Psalm, Psalm 119 is another favorite of mine. Uh, partly because when I was uh, growing up in college, in my college years and growing in my Christian faith, um, that was just like red meat to a hungry dog. You know, all about God's word and how effective it is and how beautiful it is, and that was, it just came at the right time in my life. But I, I'd say overall, Psalm 1 is probably my favorite, and we're going to look at Psalm 1, among others, today. Um, so why do we have the Psalms? We can do a little Q&A here. I'll repeat anything, but uh, what are the purpose of the Psalms in the Bible? Yes? Mm -hmm. they're, they're for us to offer us comfort from God. Through his words. Yep. What else? Praise. praise to give us the words of praise. Much of our liturgy is based in Psalms. So we are, you know, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me is right out of the Psalms, Psalm of David. So there are definitely prayers. So they give voice to our words to God. Right? What else? Yeah, they give us voice for pain, for sorrow, for suffering. The suffering servant, for instance. Or David when he's being chased all over creation by people he thought were in his family, you know, which we'll look at today. All right, and um, we, another question to ask yourself is what kind of writing is found in the Psalms? You know, obviously Psalms are based upon singing, they were meant to be sing, to be sung many times, um, or they're at least poetic from a literary sense. Um, and so they use a lot of literary techniques. Um, I have on your sheet, and I'm sorry, it'll be a little harder to take notes in here without the tables, but you might want to bring a tablet or something to put underneath. So, um, But that's assuming I say anything interesting, so no worries about that. Um, for instance, there's a technique in the Bible called um, 
parallelism. You know, um, the Lord is my light and my salvation is an example. That's simile or same parallelism. You say something and then you say it again with another word to emphasize it. Uh, there's opposite or antithetic parallelism, which is he led them by cloud by day and by a pillar at night. You know, so it gives you this happens. The good shall do this, but the wicked shall have this, right? And then the last one is expansive, where, you, where the psalmist says something, and then he says something to amplify it or make it more. So my mouth is filled with your praise all day with your lauding. Okay, so there are a lot of parallelism techniques used in the psalms. There's a lot of um, repeating of a, the, his love endures forever between each line. So you can look at the psalms as a literary work. In fact... A really good book on this is C.S. Lewis' Reflections on the Psalms. Of course, C.S. Lewis uh, was most noted for being a, um, a literary scholar. Medieval Renaissance literature was his forte. Not writing theological books as we are wont to believe, but really he was a college professor and his greatest love was languages and literature. And he, I'm not saying he limits himself to a literature aspect of the Psalms in this book, but he definitely calls upon that in his training, which gives us some good insight. So that's a good book. Uh, I actually used that a lot in the previous study. <laughs> okay, so um, how are the Psalms organized? Well, there, we'll look at several kind of ways to look at them. Herman Gunkel in the uh, second half of the 19th century into the 20th century did a five-fold classification into hymns or songs, communal laments, like somebody mentioned, our sorrow, royal psalms, which talk about the Son of God as the King or God as the King, uh, individual laments. Sometimes the psalms will say, we are lost without you, Lord. Others will say, why have you forsaken me? So we have both communal and independent lament, okay? And then, of course, probably the largest one is thanksgiving. And I think that was one of the first reasons you gave for the psalms. And Luther had another technique, which we'll look at later, um, or actually we'll look at now. Luther loved the Psalter. It was his daily prayer book. It was the topic of his initial lectures when he was a professor, and it was an important part of his piety, obviously. Um, there's a book called Reading the Psalms with Luther, which is really interesting on this. Luther said this about the Psalms. The Psalter ought to be a dear and beloved book, if only because it promises Christ's death and resurrection so clearly and so depicts his kingdom and the condition and nature of all Christendom that we may call it a little Bible. Most beautifully and briefly, it embraces everything in the entire Bible. It is made into a fine enchiridion, or handbook. So Martin Luther saw the Psalter, the Psalter, the Psalms, as almost a miniature cliff notes, if you will, to the entire Bible. And everything in the Bible is found in the Psalms, which I think is amazing. Now, Luther had a little different uh, system. I don't know if I put this on your outline um, I can make my notes available later if you want to get some of this stuff that's not. Yeah, I don't have it on here. But here, he did a little different tack than uh, Herman Gunkel. He said prophecy, instruction, comfort, prayer, or thanksgiving. Or a combination. You know, so something could be more, more than one. And of the thanksgiving psalms, Luther said, these are the psalms of the first rank. And it is for their sake that the Psalter was created. Therefore, it is called in the Hebrew, Sefer Tehillim, that is, a praise book or a book of thanksgiving. So Martin Luther's view of the psalms primarily was a book of praise and thanksgiving. Okay? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, another great... A contributor to the Lutheran faith, um, had some incredible quotes about, I have about two pages of quotes on the Bible by Dean Bonhoeffer, which is just amazing. And you're going to sense as, we, as you hear these that we're going to start moving towards a particular view 
of the Psalms, which I find very interesting, but I'll get to that in a minute. Bonhoeffer said, all prayers of the Bible are such prayers which we pray together with Jesus Christ in which he accompanies us and through which he brings us into the presence of God. So Bonhoeffer is saying the Psalms are active. They're not just words on a page, but they are a vehicle which Christ uses to bring us in the presence of God the Father. Bonhoeffer also said, if we want to read and to pray the prayers of the Bible, and especially the Psalms, therefore we must not ask first what they have to do with us, but what they have to do with Jesus Christ. And there we get our first hint of where we're going today. He said, the words which come from God become then the steps on which we find our way to God. They are a step, a a set of ascending steps that take us into the presence of God, which actually is literal in many of the Psalms, you know. A better is one day in your courts, or who will ascend to his holy hill? In Psalm 15, okay. So who prays the Psalms? Well, David, and then Solomon, and Asaph, and others. They pray the Psalms, but Christ really prays the Psalms, and with him, we pray the Psalms. The prayers of David were prayed also by Christ, Or better, Bonhoeffer says, Christ himself prayed the Psalms through his forerunner, David. How's that for a cool connection? You think about Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord said to my Lord is talking about Christ and David and God the Father. So um, we see this kind of connection emerging of Christ being present in the Psalms. Now, Bonhoeffer had his own system. He said, we shall arrange the subjects dealt with in the Psalter prayers in the following manner. He took a historical approach. Creation, law, holy history, the Messiah, the church, and then the topics of life, suffering, guilt, enemies, and the end times. One last quote from Bonhoeffer. There are no theoretical answers in the Psalms to all these questions, as there are none in the New Testament. The only real answer is Jesus Christ. So, can anyone see a pattern emerging here about the Psalms? As we step back and ask things like, why did God give them to us? Are they merely stories, prayers, songs for our use? Or is something more significant shining through? What is God trying to tell us through them? Well, the answer, I believe, and many believe, is the unifying factor, the subject, Christ himself. He is at the center of the world of God, of the word of God, and he is the focus of the Psalms. You've heard um, Pastor Tim, uh, fellows like Chad Bird, you're familiar with Chad, um, terrific writer, uh, former pastor, and wonderful author, say that all of the scriptures point to Christ, and Christ can be found everywhere in them, particularly in the Old Testament. Uh, This goes back to, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. I mean, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth, and the Spirit was hovering, and then in Colossians it says, through him all things were created. So, The the Trinity of Father, Son, and Spirit were present from creation, from the very first words of the Bible, and they're reiterated. And so um, there's a terrific book, which thanks to Larry Fain, I was reminded how great it was, even though I'd already bought it and hadn't read it. (laughs) So I bought another copy so I could have a visual. It's called Christ in the Psalms by uh, Patrick Henry Reardon. I don't know, have any of you heard of this book? It's absolutely astounding. It's one take. But I think it's a good one. And you can get this for Kindle for like 10 bucks. I think I put this in the email. Or you can get, it's 20 for a hard copy. And I bought the hard copy just because sometimes I like to have a physical book. But I got to admit that you can't, it's a lot easier to highlight the Kindle. And then you can go to your Amazon website and you can say, show me all my highlights. And then you can copy them, stick them in a Word doc. So that's kind of cool. But Patrick Henry Reardon makes the case that Christ is the unifying factor of all Scripture, which makes sense. If the Scriptures are the declaration of the story of God and man, and Christ is the way by which man and God are reconciled, 
then it would make sense that Christ ends up being the linchpin or the centerpiece of all the Bible. The entire Old Testament points to him coming, and then he comes, and then everything after he comes is about him. And one other thing to realize is that the Psalms are some of the most quoted Old Testament passages in the New Testament, certainly by Christ himself. And so we start to see this connection that um, <clears throat> Christ is the centerpiece, and in the Psalms, this miniature Bible, as Luther called it, he lands, and he tells us the entire story of God and our entire story. Now, um, so Reardon says, we don't begin with the Old Testament. We begin with Christ. Christ is not only the mediator between God and man, he's also be the mediator between the Old Testament and the church. Um, he says in his book that without Christ, the Old Testament is an interesting old book of Jewish literature, but really has not a lot to do with us. Okay, it's interesting, but there's really no connection to modern-day Christians. There's some handouts right there. If you look at the Psalms in light of Christ, it's a whole different story. Now you see how God, through history, is building his people, the nation of Israel, to await the coming of his son, the Messiah, to deliver the whole world. And so the Christ proclaimed in the gospel brings the Old Testament with him into the proclamation. Jesus, by his very words, united Old Testament history and his coming. Remember, he stood up and, and, and spoke those words in the temple, and then he said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's basically saying, all that stuff you've been reading for hundreds of years, it's about me. Here I am. Any questions? If you want to fall on your knees right now, it would be a good time. Didn't work out that way all the time, but that's what basically he's saying. He's saying, here we are, okay? Any questions or comments so far? Because I really don't want to just listen to me. So any thoughts? If you think of Christ being the centerpiece of the Bible and even of the Psalms, which we haven't really explored yet, but we will, do you have any thoughts? Anything come to mind? Make sense? Is it a fair assessment, do you think? Or is it a reach? <laughs> Christ in everything, really? You know, Christ and the donkey speaking to Balaam, really? You know, um, but, but I think we can do that. Now, this approach, this looking for Christ in the Psalms or looking for Christ everywhere in the Old Testament can lead to confusion. Okay, here's, here's some examples. Um, for instance, I mentioned Tim mentioning how we look for Christ in, in the story. Uh, you're all familiar with the the story of the Good Samaritan. And the classic interpretation of that story is that Jesus, you remember the question he was asked when he told that story? Do you remember what he said and what was asked? He, right, he, he said, love your neighbors yourself, and some wise guy in the front row probably aced all the tests in class, said, who's my neighbor? I'll get out of this one. And then he told this story where he painted a people very separated from the Jews, the Samaritans, as being the good guys. And then he said, who's my neighbor? And they said, well, probably the guy who helped him. Okay? So the classic interpretation of this scripture passage is, we should all be good Samaritans, right? We should all be good little McKinney Christians and shop at the right places and be nice to people and pray for our enemies, and especially in times of election, you know, but Tulian Chavigian, the former pastor of Coral Ridge in Florida, said, no, we are all the man beaten and left by the side of the road. So who's the good Samaritan? Thank you, Jesus. Now, you turn that story around and you go, oh, interesting. Because, you see, we have in our human nature, our fallen nature, this undying tense a tendency to somehow cast ourselves as the hero or the good guy. Or even if we're not perfect, we're getting better. Not as bad as I was yesterday. Well, Thursday was a bad day, but other than that, I'm doing pretty good, right? That's sort of our 
modus operandi is that we like to think we're improving and getting a little more godly. And um, I've heard several uh, surveys on this, but um, I heard one on the radio today cracked me up. They took a survey of several hundred prison inmates and said, are you better or worse in terms of morality than the average person? And 60% of them thought they were better. And I'm like, but you're in prison, so what's wrong with this picture? But see, most people tend to paint themselves in a better light than they really are. Okay, so, and this gets us in trouble in the scripture. So that's one thing we've got to realize right away. When you read the stories in the scriptures, make sure you're assigning the characters to the right people. Don't always cast yourself as the hero. Because <laughs> you might be, not that it's wrong, and certainly there are instructional, you know. I mean, okay, let's put it this way. There's, there's two dangers when reading the Bible too prescriptively. One is it's all instructions, and we just got to do it all. We read all these injunctions from Paul and we just get worn out or we read the Sermon on the Mount and we get discouraged. But we, like David has actually preached on this many times here at Our Savior, I'll just keep trying harder, I'll keep running on the treadmill faster and maybe somehow I'll get godliness someday, okay? Well, that's the one extreme we fall into. The other extreme is, well, Jesus did it all, there's nothing I can do, all my works are like filthy rags, I'm just going to hang out on the couch. In fact, he preached a sermon on this. Do you remember? Treadmill, couch. And, and he said, actually, Lutherans are guilty of both of these. Okay? The right answer is neither. The right answer is Christ has done it all. Now get up off the couch and go live your life in Christ's filling you, filling you with his spirit, empowering you. You still didn't come up with this obedience, but you now have the ability to have it because Christ is in you. Okay? So I think as we continue to look at these stories, we have to be careful that we don't see the, even the Psalms as just purely instructional or purely historical, and that's all. Christ is in them, and every time we see Christ in the Scriptures, we are seeing God's story unfold, and you're never disappointed. Every time we focus on Him, you're going to learn something about Him and about yourself you're going to have a new sense of gladness, and you're also going to have a new sense of, oh, well, I didn't quite make, make it there. But he forgives you, and he picks you up and moves you on. Okay, so that's one problem with misreading the Scripture. Another problem inherent in the Psalms themselves is the entire Word of God, obviously, is God's utterance, right? Would anybody here disagree with that? It's all Scriptures inspired by God, right? But... Not all the words in the Bible are God's words. Some are man's words. Some are Christ's words. Some words are fool's words. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Or Herod stood up to make a speech and they said he has the voice of a God, which immediately got him in trouble. So there is some untruth spoken in the Bible, we all agree, by characters in the Bible. But if God created the whole Bible, he created all the words. So we start to see the the Bible as a drama with parts. And God wrote all the parts. Some of them are true, some of them are not true, some of them are God, some of them are not God. Okay? So, the entire word of God is the inspired utterance of God, yet there are so many styles of speaking, even just in the Psalms. Sometimes the first person narrative is perfect. Oh, Lord, I have kept all your commandments. Anybody ever prayed that psalm with a little bit of fear and trepidation? No, I have not kept all your commandments. And yet I'm supposed to pray this scripture because that's what it says. Sometimes the voice in the psalms is flawed. It's weak. It's contrite. You know, I have failed you. I'm miserable. I'm knocked down by my enemies. I have committed a sin. I have sinned in my heart against you. Sometimes it is forgiving and gracious. Sometimes the Lord wraps his arms around us like a mother hen, like uh, Psalm 23 and other psalms of comfort. Sometimes the psalms can be judgmental and harsh. So we see all these voices in the psalms, and how do we reconcile that? Well, we think of the concept of conversation. 
Reardon in his book tells us that conversation is especially a trait of the Psalms where we discover not only ourselves speaking to God about Christ, but also Christ speaking to his Father about us, and so on. The voice, in other words, which character is speaking will vary not only from psalm to psalm, but even within a single psalm. Now, I'm going to teach a concept here from the book, which I think is really fascinating, uh, this concept of voice, all right? According to Justin Martyr, the Jews rejected Jesus were deceived by a failure to recognize the variety of voices in the Scripture. The divine word, said Justin, sometimes speak, speaks as from the person, or apo prosopu, that term, apo prosopu. Did I put that on your outline? If I didn't, don't worry about it. Prosopu is the important word, the voice of God, the ruler and father of all. Sometimes he speaks from the prosopu, or the voice of Christ. And sometimes he speaks from the voice of God's people answering him. Does that make sense? So like you, you have a play and you have the characters, person A said this, person B said this, and then person C said this, and we can start reading the Psalms that way. And Justin Martyr told Marcus Aurelius, you may observe this even in your own writers, when one writer speaks for all, but introduces other people in the conversation, prosopa dialogomena, which is a term that was used in his first apology. So Justin's term prosopo or prosopon had a long history. We find it way back as far as Homer's Odyssey. And a good definition for the word is face. And that came from Greek theater, where actors wore masks. Tragedy, comedy, remember that? And they would, they would put on a mask and they would be that person. And then they would change masks and they would be a different person. And from that reference, it was a short step for prosopon to just signify the character. Played by so in the Psalter, biblical narrative takes on a personal quality. Praying the Psalms brings drama. We are led in on a divine or cosmic play to all these words spoken by various people. For instance, when you pray the Psalms of David, you assume the voice of David, right? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. David said those words after he was, you know, exhorted by Nathan the prophet. You know, we can pray those words. We pray them every Sunday. We can pray those words, and um, we can pray them with David. We can pray the words of David. But when I recite the lines of this psalm, its reference is not, reduced to the things in my life, but rather we are elevated into a larger drama going on, the drama of God's story. So this is kind of a tough one to get, but I really hope you get this. Don't take the Bible and say, all right, I got 15 minutes. What can I get for today? You know, 15 quick minutes in the Bible to help me get through my shopping experience. You know, rather than de-elevate the scripture to apply to our menial lives, Enter the scripture and see the world elevated and see your part. Henry Blackaby, the Bible uh, teacher, uh, had a line, said, if you want to do God's will, find out what God's doing and go get to be a part of it. Don't expect God to come and zap you in your living room while you're waiting on the couch for divine inspiration. But he said, find out what God is doing. Like the old song uh, by Scott Wesley Brown, look what God is doing all across the land. God is working. Find out what he's doing, and that's what we do with the scriptures, okay? So, when we pray the Psalms, therefore, the words are not spoken in our own voice. We put on, rather, what St. Paul called the mind of Christ. Through the inspired lines of Psalms, the Holy Spirit inserts our prayer into the conversation, the dialogia, the dialogue of the Father and the Son. So, does this all make sense? It's an interesting way to look at the Psalms. It's to put it simply, when you crack open the Bible, say what's going on in here is way more important than what's going on in here. Let's put me in there and see how it affects me rather than pulling my nugget, my dashboard verse for the day to get me through a traffic jam, you know, which seriously misses so much of the glory and the beauty of Scripture. Um, one of my favorite books I've 
said in this study many times is Robert Mulholland's Shaped by the Word, the Power of Scripture and Spiritual Formation. And he has a great line, which I just never forgot, which says, some people see the Bible as a book of knowledge that you can master, like a chemistry textbook, you know, or an LSAT or something. And he said, no, it's a window. The Bible is a window to the world of the divine where we open it and the light comes in and it changes us. So we don't ever master the Bible. We want the Bible to master us because the Bible is the living, active utterance of God. And it's always shining on us. God never gives up pursuing us. Okay, let's start with the first psalm, if you don't mind. And um, we're going to take a look at, actually, Reardon puts all first, the three of the first three psalms together, so we're going to zip through three psalms today. No waiting. Bonus. Three for one day. So, um, who would like to read Psalm 1? Anybody have it handy? Okay, read strong and loud. Okay, love that psalm. Thank you. Terrific reading. Who is this psalm talking about? Huh? It it could be all of us. It could be a godly man. You know, it could be, you know. I mean, obviously this psalm is offering us two choices, obeying God or, or departing into wickedness. Follow God or depart from him, reap the consequences. Then the ending caps off the whole story. The wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the, in the congregation of the righteousness. But who is this man? Well, some scholars believe, I had never heard this, and I think this is fascinating. Some scholars believe this man is pre-fallen Adam. The perfect human being before the fall. Think about it. He's, he's tilling land and water streams are flowing, trees are growing, there's fruit everywhere, and everything he does, he prospers. There again is one of those Bible extremes where we go, well, I would love to believe that's true about my life, but I can't say that everything is prospering. But in this psalm, it says everything is prospering. This is a prescription and a description of a life lived fully and completely in the presence and intimacy of God. But Reardon goes one step further. He actually says this man is Christ, who was the perfect man, right? There have been two perfect men. Adam created, Jesus not created, right? Everybody else down the hill. Second half of the psalm, right? But, All of these descriptions in this psalm are completely fulfilled in Christ. Does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Does not hang out with sinners. But he delights in the law of the Lord. We know how Jesus delighted in God's law. How much he quoted it. He said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay? And the fruit of his labors is not just trees and fruit, it's salvation of the world, okay? So Psalm 1, I don't usually use fill-ins, but I gave you some today. Psalm 1 describes Christ, the perfect man, okay? Now there's much here for us to strive for. Certainly, Psalm 1 can inspire us in our lives. Walking, standing, and sitting are descriptions of the choices that we make in reference to sin every day. So think about this. You walk through life. You don't walk certain places. (laughs) 
or stuff's going to happen. You encounter something, you, hmm, you take note of it, okay? Standing, that means you actually stop walking and you kind of ponder this. You dwell in it, you stay in it. And sitting means you just plant yourself down. You've fully fallen in, okay? Um, in, the, in some of the Proverbs, when it talks about the foolish young man walking down the streets and he heads towards the house of the woman of ill repute, we see this whole thing played out. First of all, he's walking in the wrong place. Then he's standing and listening to the story, and then he enters the house and sitting. So it's a description. And if we walk through life and encounter sin, we've got to be wary of the temptation to stop, look, and listen, or to pause and really consider and finally to land headlong in sin, just like the prodigal son leaned in and finally fell right in the hog pen with him. That happens to us if we don't be careful where we walk, stand, or sit, okay? Now, Christ experienced the same thing, right? Christ walked through life with sin all around him. But he never gave in. He never was affected by it. He was never, um, he never, it never successfully had a hold on him. Psalm 1 accurately describes the adult, the, the result. He does not. Uh, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He delights in the law. And so um, it, we see Christ's life portrayed in this psalm. He's the perfect man because of these things that show us that. And one last note. Did you notice that the very first psalm starts with a word from the Beatitudes? Blessed. How interesting, just like the Sermon on the Mount. This shows us that God is the author and the creator of life and breath and of faith and belief and experience and destiny. God blesses us in all of life, and this gives us motion and energy and purpose. So, I hope you can see from this, this is a real quick look at Psalm 1. You can read it in several ways. You can read it as a way to live. You can read it as a description of man, were he not plagued by sin? Or you can actually read it as a description of Christ. We can assign this psalm to creation. This is the life God intended for us. Had man not fallen, this would be all of our experience, okay? All right? So, let's look at Psalm 2. Um, this is kind of a long one, but if somebody wants to read it, they can, or if they don't, I'll be glad to read it. But anybody want to take a crack at Psalm 2? All right, Anna's got it. Terrific. Okay, so I'm completely lost in my notes here, and I'm very sorry, so I'll use yours. What, what is this psalm about? What is this psalm? Let me ask you this. How does this psalm follow Psalm 1? If Psalm 1 is about the perfect man versus scoffers and sinners, well, how would you describe this psalm? What is it telling us the story of? Right. This is Psalm 1 gone terribly wrong, right? It's the battle lines are drawn. Man 
left to his own devices, will not only stand, walk, stand, or sit in the path of sinners, but he'll become a sinner. He'll uh, join with other sinners. They'll form sinful groups and tribes and cities and eventually nations. And we will have the whole story of the Old Testament to show all this, okay? This is what happens when evil goes unchecked, okay? But it also, excuse me, it also introduces a person to the, to the rhetoric, the Messiah. God says, here's what the perfect man does, here's what the perfect man doesn't do. Now all these people who didn't do good, they're gonna, it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and it's gonna, eventually they're going to band together, and there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and oh, what a mess we have. What am I going to do? Well, God didn't let you say that because he always knows what he's going to do. He says, I'm going to send my son, the Messiah. So this psalm brings everything to a head and then brings us God's solution, the coming of the Messiah. So it's not hard to see Jesus in this one at all. He's the solution. Man's sin is the problem. He's the solution, right? And there's a couple of things in here that you've probably noticed. Um, verse 4, um, I'm in the ESV here. He who sits in the heavens laughs, laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. I have, to me, I, I have the view of God at the Tower of Babel. And man is trying to think that he's more than he is. And God's laughing and saying, yeah, really? you know, be gone, and scatters them in the confusion of language. He laughs at their futile attempts to be godlike, which is exactly what they were doing, right? They wanted to ascend to heaven, okay? There's another one. Uh, verse 7, I will tell of the degree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. What does that remind you of? Does that remind you of another passage maybe in the New Testament? <laughs> yeah, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Or the transfiguration, this is my son, listen to him. It's God speaking to, about Christ, the Messiah, okay? And he's giving Christ full reign. He's saying, you're going to break the ends of the earth with a rod and dash them to pieces. So, you sinful nations, be warned. You're on probation here. The Messiah's coming. What are you going to do about it, Okay? And he even offers them respite. He says, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice and trembling. Kiss the Son. Embrace this Messiah I am sending you. Or you're going to make him angry and you're going to perish. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And we're seeing right in these last verses this dichotomous relationship of Christ as avenger and judge and Christ as comfort and respite. You know, don't make him angry, psh, problem, but embrace him and he will take care of you and he'll guide you through everything in life, okay? So, Psalm 2 describes Christ as the coming Messiah. The solution to the problem whose roots we saw barely mentioned in Psalm 1. So if Psalm 1 is creation and Genesis, Psalm 2 is basically the whole Old Testament, right? All the wars, everything we've studied in this class, um, Samuel and Kings and Ezekiel and, and all these uh, countries invading one another, all trying to get the upper hand, all trying to win. Um, why do the nations rage? They're raging because they want to be God, and they're not. <laughs> so they're going to try anyway. All right. So let's go to Psalm 3. This will be the last one we look at today. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, if you have any favorite psalms you'd like us to study, um, send them to me. I don't know that we're going to do all 150, although that would be cool. But I certainly want to hit ones that are near and dear to you. So if you have any, you know, be sure and let me know. Send me an email, okay? All right, I'll read Psalm 3. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom's son. We all remember that story because we studied it, right? O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my son, 
There is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Okay, so on the surface, this psalm is about what? What does it say it's about? Yeah, but I think before that, it's telling us the story of David fleeing Absalom. It's a psalm of David, and he wrote it probably from some cave when he's eating canned beans because that's all they brought, you know, and, and his enemies are outside the cave. But like you said, if we consider voice, we hear the imprint of the suffering servant in these words. Many are my foes. Many rise against me. Compare this to Jesus' words on the cross or leading up to through the passion. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me, which is true for Jesus every time except for the cross and the Garden of Gethsemane for that matter when he said, take this cup from me, but he said, not my will but yours. God the Father always answered Jesus' son's prayer except on the cross when he couldn't because they were separated. Arise, O Lord, and save me. You can take each of these phrases and you can imagine Jesus saying it. Jesus fully depended on his Father for everything. His time in the wilderness, answering questions of his enemies, the Garden of Gethsemane, and even offering forgiveness for his enemies from the cross. All of those are things that Christ did which are mirrored in this psalm. Okay? So, Psalm 3 describes Christ as the suffering servant. And this is a scene, a scene that we're going to read over and over again. Of course, the most famous is probably Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is repeated by Christ before he died. Okay? So, according to Reardon, I tend to agree with him. The first three psalms are the foundation of the whole book. The perfect man, Christ. Christ the Messiah, Savior of the world. And Christ the suffering servant, how he's going to do it. And then every other psalm is going to spin out of these and it's going to either talk about some aspect of God the Father or some aspect of Christ the Son or some aspect of us. And obviously, it'll also often use historical references like David and Absalom or David and his confession of sin, okay? So, um, thoughts, comments? Does this stir anything in your mind? Yes? Say la, yeah. It's kind of like a hallelujah or a yay God. Like, yeah, it's a musical punctuation in the singing of that psalm in public. It's known as a musical interlude. In fact, there's a footnote. It, the meaning of the Hebrew word selah used frequently in psalms is uncertain, but it may be a musical or liturgical direction. The psalms were meant be sung in church. I mean, they were meant, they were never meant only for personal devotions. They were meant for community. Yes? Yeah, one of our liturgical pieces, in peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, or our prayers. Um, the pastor will pray, um, Lord, in your mercy, and we say, hear our prayer. You know, and so uh, this is a very common, uh, it's, it's active worship. Um, 
not that I want to open this old can of worms, but back in the days of the so-called worship wars between contemporary and traditional people, people would often say, well, contemporary worship so much more energetic and active. I say, oh, no, no, not so. Traditional worship is very active. There's a part for everybody to play. And there's things we say. You know, we stand up and we kneel and we pray and we say together and we sing together. And so I think all good worship of any kind is active and has a part for everyone to play. Yeah. Yes. We actually have those in some of our planning docs, and we probably need to start doing that more, where we do things antiphonally or call and response. So, I remember one time Pastor Nathan Wendorf, who was our associate uh, way back with Pastor Tutwiler, one day had the congregation stand and face the middle, so they were facing each other and do their confession absolution. So they were confessing to one another. Because it's real easy to hang out during confession in the back row and kind of not say a lot and hope nobody notices you. You know what you've done, but you're not going to tell anyone else. But to stand there and to tell your brothers and sisters, I've sinned, I've let you down, I'm sorry, is really powerful. I think he also did it once for the Apostles' Creed where we declared the truth of what we believe to one another. And that can be very powerful as well. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes. Well, my first answer would be um, now, which verse were you reading? Yeah. Yeah. I would do a word search on laugh. Of course, we know one person who laughed and kind of got in hot water for it. You remember that? Sarah, yeah. Laughing is good unless you're laughing at what God says. Then I don't recommend it. I've got a search here. Let me uh, do a quick search and I'll just see. Right, right. Yeah. Well, in uh, Psalm 37, verse 13, the Lord laughs at the wicked. For he sees that his day is coming. Proverbs 126, I will laugh at your calamity. So I think in these cases, it's not God making fun of his creation. I don't think it's mean spirited. It's have you ever seen somebody do something really, really dumb? You might have seen that on TV last week. I don't know. Possible. Did you just laugh and go, What were you thinking? You know, I mean, that's, I think that's the kind of laughter. God is just, just exclaiming his, his um, amusement at the folly of man, to think that man can amount to anything without God. Okay? So, but I, there might be a few other places, but that'd be a good study. You can bring back your results and share it with us. Okay, anybody else? Yes? Right. That's a great observation. She said how in Psalm 3... He cried out to the Lord and he answered from his holy hill and then the, uh, the, the writer of the psalm lays down and sleeps and is refreshed. Um, first of all, David slept well. David always, We saw this in our study of Samuel. David always took care of business by asking God about everything he was about to do before he did it. And he slept well at night because God took care of him. Saul, not so much. 
He'd run off, burst headlong into the field, do something and go, I hope that was okay, God. You know the old, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Well, that's true with man sometimes. That's not a good idea with God. And I think my guess is Psalm slept, uh, Saul slept terribly. And the fact is he was possessed by an evil spirit, which I think was some kind of psychological anxiety and angst. And he had to hire David to come and play the harp for him to soothe his spirit. He was a man in turmoil, quite the opposite of this, for the very same reason. He didn't trust in God. Also, there's a few things about sleep. Actually, Reardon Reardon says a lot in the book, if you get it, about sleep. It's really interesting. He says, we avoid sleep sometimes. We we just can't get enough done, you know. Especially in college. There is no sleep in college. But... um, uh, and also sleep is the only time we can't pray. <laughs> we can't actively talk to God, but we also can't actively pursue other things too. And so, um, but the scripture says that the Lord um, gives to those he loves in sleep, in slumber. He says, do not toil early in the morning and late at night in your day because I take care of you when you sleep. Sleep is the time when we are recharged spiritually, like she said, but also uh, I listened to a podcast guy named Sean Stevenson, a health guy, and he says you wouldn't believe the amount of things that go on in your body while you sleep. Um, you, you breathe out toxins. You, um, you, your, your brain works out problems, details. Your body chemistry kind of resets itself. He says sleep is really important for our health. And from a very pragmatic standpoint. So um, it's a time when we aren't in control, but God is. And so God ministers to us in our sleep. Uh, Another thing, uh, John Ortberg, who's one of my favorite preachers and teachers, said, uh, it was a common thought in Jewish culture that the day began with the night before. And so John says that he would kind of do an assessment of his day and a prayer for the day ahead at night before he went to sleep. He would kind of set the table for the following day, you know, so that he was ready for that day. Rather than get up in the morning, oh, what do I do? Where's my coffee? I can't find my briefcase, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I certainly know that I'm better off if I lay everything out uh, I, I, I am such an electronically uh, um, chained person that I have six things I have to charge at night before I go to bed. I have to charge my laptop, my iPad, my phone, my AirPods, my headphones, you know, my Fitbit watch, and um, there's some, oh, my speaker for my, that I use for teaching that plays music. On, and I was like, if I don't do that at night and I get up and I get to the class and the stuff's not working, whose fault is that? It's mine. So the, the, the evening... Finishing out your day well and planning for the day ahead can actually be really a good thing. Then you can, like she said, you can sleep, you can relax, you can let God do his work in you, and you can wake up with far fewer cares in the world than you might have had. And it's a much better alternative than falling into bed exhausted because you only got 37 things of your list of 50 done before you went to bed. I do not like that feeling at all. Oh, right. No need to rile your... I read mine in the morning. I, I don't watch... Well, I've been watching news a lot during the election and stuff, but I on my iPhone, when I turn off my alarm, I read Apple News, and I basically zip through like 10 things, and then that's the last thing I do with news the whole day. You know, in fact, I got a... I opened my phone this morning and said, oh, yeah, Alabama won the championship game last night, which I totally forgot there was even a game, which is very weird for me. Obviously, I wasn't watching it, but yeah, I'd rather know in the morning. I can do a lot more with it than I can at night. (laughs) Any other thoughts? Okay, well, I hope this has been helpful to you, and uh, what we'll do now is we'll just kind of go, we'll walk through some individual psalms, and we may hop around, maybe hit the big hitters first, but I'd like to encourage you all to look for a different take, not just the standard one, you know? Um... Look for Christ. Look for yourself fitting into his story. And that will give you a different orientation. And um, go back and read some of your favorite psalms this week. If you send me yours, you know, um, go read them and, 
and see if they look a little different. Try to discover Christ in them where maybe you hadn't before. And uh, I highly recommend this book. It's, 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 really, it's really terrific, and, um, and he really has great stuff to say, not just about Christ in the Psalms specifically, but about our faith and devotional life in general. Um, he starts, and, the, and by the way, the print is tiny, so I couldn't read this. I need the Kindle. But, but he says, for instance, talks about the unity of the Bible and how Scripture interprets Scripture and how the Bible is consistent in this story. And there's just, there's just some great, some great um, takes on things that we kind of take for granted. So, Anyway, if there's no more questions, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the Psalms. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, an, it's an old name that we don't use anymore. Uh, it was used into the 19th century, I think, even. So, but yeah. And he loved them, you know. Of course, he was a musician, too, and their hymns and songs, so you can't blame him. All right. Well, let me pray for us, and I'll uh, send you on your way. Lord, thank you for the insight um, from your word, which illuminates us and enlightens us and sustains us. And I pray that as always in these studies, your word will become more than mere words on a page, but it'll be a a window, a gateway into your world uh, that we might see heaven brought down on earth and all around us. Help us to constantly search for you and to search for your son in the scriptures. Not merely content to derive uh, instructions or rules for living, but to see the big story that you have graciously invited us to take part in. Uh, May we do that in this day and the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.